Hey everybody, welcome to AO Mentor Session with Tom Black. I just wanted you guys to know that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in February here in Nashville. If you haven't signed up, you should. Sean told me we're about to sell out, so let's uh, get those uh, reservations in and we're going to have a blast. We're going to learn a lot. Everybody is uh, going to be glad they came. Nobody that came has ever told me, oh, it was a waste of my time or my money. So just sign up. Trust me, drink the Kool-Aid. Um, the second thing I want to say is I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving next week. I hope you're with your friends and loved ones and family. And if you don't get a chance to be because of COVID or any other reason, then uh, I hope you'll give them a phone call. Uh, you know, it's just important to stay in touch with friends and family. So let's get started this morning. And uh, I have my questions here. And I didn't have any hard ones this week, so that's great, huh? Here's one. Without a team to delegate to and without the budget to hire a full team, how did you get things done when you first started your company and it was just you? Okay? And I don't know who asked that question. But this is the background. I hear many experienced entrepreneurs talk about delegating and only during the things you are great at and unfortunately it's only me and I'm just starting so I don't have the team nor the money to hire a full team I know I can't be alone in trying to understand how to get everything done on a limited budget and it only being me how did you do it when you were first starting is it just a mindset or where did you go to learn everything to get everything done looking for your story thanks so much well um, the easy answer to that is you work 90 hours a week you work 15 hours a day, six days a week, take off Sunday. A lot of times I work Sunday too. But if you aren't putting in that kind of time, this question is a waste of my time, frankly, because it is not easy. No, being an entrepreneur is not easy. There is no easy answers. You know, I always say easy is overrated, and I believe that it is. So, secondly, you can always get partners in your venture. Find a like-minded individual, become partners, and delegate the work that way. I've done that before in ventures that I've started or co-founded, you know. Um, but there's no easy way. You just have to do it yourself till you have enough money to outsource, and then you should outsource anything that isn't an income-producing activity. I talk to the people I work with, and I always say, what did you do last week that was not an income producing activity? Eliminate it, delegate it, get rid of it. All right. So anyway, this from Michelle. Hey, Michelle. Michelle Adams. By the way, if you haven't ordered Christmas gifts yet, you should go on Michelle Adams' Facebook page or her website and go ahead and get your Christmas uh, treat orders in now because she's going to be slammed at Christmas. And she is a great pastry and cake chef. Okay? Cookies. Question. What ideas do you have for my company to do outreach to customers who would buy my products as gifts for others? The description, I own the Sugar Path, a dessert business that is retail and e-commerce shops. We ship cake jars and cookies nationwide. One path I want to take is to do outreach in order to have customers buy my products as gifts for others. How would you get the word out? What organizations or communities or other leads would you outreach to? Thanks, Tom. Well, I, I, we talked about this in Nashville, and everybody brainstorming had a lot of great ideas, and if you didn't take notes, shame on you. But, you know, we talked about letting schools use these as fundraisers, right? Give them a sheet of paper, let them take orders, and then you produce what they take orders for, and they get half the money, you get half the money, you know? That's a good idea. Another, uh, uh, better selling candles. Uh, another uh, uh, idea we had was to go to big HR departments and home uh, human resource departments and large companies, call on them as gifts for their employees. You know, Greg Burnett has a company that's part of AO, and he has sells specialty items like the AO hats and the AO t-shirts we have. I'd identify those specialty products companies and see if they wouldn't like to represent your product to corporate uh, purchasers of uh, gifts and, and sussies. 
So those are just some quick ideas, Michelle. But the other thing I'd do is I would do email marketing out the yin yang. This is something I'm gonna tell everybody, listen to this, do this. I've had the people that do it, it works. The problem is I don't even have 50% batting average for the people I've told to do this who actually take the time to do it, shame on you. So go on Facebook, write a direct message, something like this. Hey, it's nice to be friends on Facebook. If you didn't know, I have a dessert company that specializes in cookies and cakes in the jar. If you ever need desserts for an event, or as gifts, please let me know. My email is, my cell is. And I promise if you'll do that, you will generate business from it. And it's so easy. It's the only way I've found to monetize Facebook, um, you know, and actually get something out of it financially, okay? So next question um, is from Dan. Hey, Dan, uh, Razmanovsky. He was part, that name is part of the Russian royalty. Razmanovsky, and he is a first-generation American, and he served our country. Thank you very much for your service, Dan. And he asked this question. Could you please walk me through some of the steps I need to take to hire a door-to-door -door salesperson? Okay, so I've worked with some Verizon franchises that sell Verizon services door-to-door. -door. We set up a recruiting system, and then we set up a sales training system, and um, you know, those businesses are all going, they're up in the New Jer greater New Jersey area. There are four of them that I work with. So anyway, I can tell you that you're going to have to use ads and, uh, I don't think you want to say door to door in the ad, but I think you're going to want to then screen the resumes or if they don't send a resume and application, I think your target is going to be kids that I don't mean kids, but young men and women who have just graduated from college or who've dropped out of college. I think you have an extra challenge with um, uh, COVID, so you're gonna wanna print up some flyers or door hangers so that while they're going door to door, they can leave a flyer or a door hanger. We've had good success with that, with a lot of the people that um, have been using door hangers and flyers. Uh, you know, Edmund, every time he puts flyers on people's cars outside his stores, uh, he increases his business. We just need to get him to do it more often, right? Okay. And Dan, we can go into that in more detail, but that's just a quick idea of what to do. The most important part isn't recruiting them, it's onboarding them. In other words, training them for success and preparing them for success so that they don't have to constantly be rehiring and retraining, okay? Um, here is a Sorry, I skipped the page. Here is a uh, question from uh, Allison. Hey, uh, Allison, how are you? Uh, the question is, um, can you talk to me about qualifying a prospect and how I can do that in my business? So recently she had a lead that I felt wasn't quite right for my company. He used 40 minutes of my time. When he first sent me an email with all the business information, it seemed like a good lead to begin with but he ended up saying he couldn't afford to pay for services, but he would pay me with a percentage of sales. His product was promising, but he as an owner did not seem like a fit for my company. He seemed like a working relationship, a full service digital marketing agency passionate about using digital marketing strategies and creative content to help businesses stand out from their competition, generate more sales and gain brand awareness. Okay, so Allison is suffering under a conception that I think a lot of solopreneurs, entrepreneurs suffer from. And that is that everybody is going to say yes. You know, how could they possibly say no to me? Well, in B2B sales, if you're in that sales, the national average is for every nine people you tell your story to, one doesn't buy. I mean, one buys. Eight don't buy, one buys. That means you're going to get eight no's before you get one yes. And so I consider the waste of your time just the price you pay to get to the one who's gonna buy. And I don't really think about it as wasting time. I think it as part of the continuum. You know, sales is a continuum. And here's the ball, and one spot on the ball is a yes, and eight spots on the ball are no's. But you have to get the whole ball. You can't buy just the yes. And so when you look at sales that way, 
you don't feel like people are wasting your time, you're just on your way to a no. Now that being said, the minute you know they are wasting your time, say thank you very much and move on. Um, you know, I can't speak to this specific situation, Allison, because I don't know the details. I have friends in digital advertising that make a lot of money from co-oping with their uh, customers. They take a percentage and the customer gets a percentage. But I can't make a decision about this one in particular or what kind of businessman he is. But in general, I would say this, you're better off getting paid than waiting on him to make a sale for you to get paid, okay? Um, but if you don't have anything else to do and you believe in the product and if you were an entrepreneur, you would start a business with that product, why not? Um, next is from Stephen Davis. Hey, Stephen. And Stephen wants to know what my advice is regarding how to handle prospects that are solely focused on price. Uh, SUD Consulting specializes in human resources, workers' comp, and financial issues that companies face. We represent multiple personal employment organizations, that's PEOs. The reason I'm asking this question is I'm currently dealing with a prospect who is solely focused on price, regardless of value. The prospect is a sizable company that has great influence in their industry. Obviously, you can only reduce a price so far, but what is the best way to manage this situation? I do not want to lose a prospect and potential future referral business. Okay. So I know this situation very well because we've talked about this situation. But in general, the, the cost issue, if it's verbalized by the prospect, then it's much harder for you to solve the problem than it was had you verbalized the uh, situation before um, they brought up price. In other words, I always like to say, we are not the low cost provider early in the process. I mean, no, sorry, start. I like to say we are not the lowest price of entry. There'll be somebody that is the lowest price of entry for a PPO for your company. And if that's the only thing you care about, we probably are not going to win that. However, we are the low cost provider. You see, the cost of this product for you, Mr. Businessman, it isn't just the entry price. It's also the quality of the product, does it take care of your employees, and the quality of the service. When something goes wrong or there's a question, do you get served properly? And so if quality of the product and quality of service are not as important to you as price, then we probably aren't going to win. Uh, let me just ask you this, are you a price? That's, that's what I would ask early in the sales process, and I would get to the low cost provider versus the cheapest entry price. And, you know, um, if you can get there, you'll have a lot more chance of success. There'll still be price buyer, buyers, Stephen. I mean, there's still gonna be people that you can't convince, but you know, you have to make that pitch early in the sales process or it's you're probably doomed because he wants a quote. I want a quote, give me a quote. I need a quote, please give me a quote. I'll give you a quote, but we're not going to be the lowest. So should I give you a quote anyway? <laughs> you know, don't be afraid to do the takeaway. You know, the reason I ask is because we are never the lowest price. Uh, well, maybe we are sometimes. But the truth of the matter is we are the low cost provider. And this is why. Okay, that's why so many trucking companies have chosen to work with us. Okay, next. How do I know if I'm advertising in the right place and whether or not I'm getting a good return on my marketing investment? The background is I'm a garage door installation and service company and I'm currently advertising through Angie's List, Facebook ads and Google ads. Currently have a media ad company handling the Facebook and good Google ads, Angie's List provides leads. So I'm really familiar with Angie's List and Google ads and Facebook ads. I work with other entrepreneurs, lots of them that use the, that media to advertise in. And they get good results sometimes and sometimes they don't. But the ones I work with that use Angie's List, you know, they basically um, set a budget and they, you know, get the leads based on the budget that they spend each month. So then once they get the leads, it's up to you to close the deal. We're going to talk more about that, Michael. Even today, we're going to talk about that. But 
Anyway, I think the only way you can judge whether your advertising works or not is by the results you get. So if you get 10 leads from Angie's List, that sounds pretty good for $200. You know, if it's $2,000, you may have to evaluate it, you know? Google Ads, is, uh, you pay to play, and so if you can, are converting a lot of those Google Ad clicks, then that's great. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is you have to decide that there's no formula and it's all based on results, right? And if you're not getting results, don't advertise there. Your company is too small to worry much about branding from a, uh, that standpoint. And I think there are better ways to brand than, uh, you know, Google Ads or Angie's List or, or Facebook, okay? Especially in a market your size, Philadelphia, okay? Next question is from Christopher Joseph. Have you heard of Amway e-commerce businesses? If so, what are your experiences with them? And if I get in multi-level marketing, how should I determine if it's right for me? And then he gives this long explanation of somebody he's trying to partner with. And, you know, basically he says that this guy's gonna show him exactly how to do it and connect him with the right people. And he'll be retiring in six years, so he's gonna turn the business over to Christopher. Um, Christopher's asking him for a recommendation going forward to deal with him. Well, I would just say this, every multi-level marketing company that I've been associated with doing sales training or sales management training has the same formula for success, 90 hours a week. <laughs> you know, they're just not giving the money away, Christopher. I wish they were. I wish I could tell you, hey, have you heard about this? It's easy money. You know, I just don't know about anything like that. Can you build a, long, a large business with Amway? Yes. Can you build a large business with Rodan and Fields? Yes. I know a woman who makes over a million dollars a year here in Nashville with Rodan and Fields. And so there are plenty of opportunities in these multi-level marketing companies for you to get rich. However, you have to go to work and there's no easy way around it. This guy make it easier for you, maybe, but you're still gonna have to put in the time. And so you have to ask yourself, is this where I wanna trade my time for purchasing power? Or is there a better place I can trade my time for purchasing power, okay? So good luck with that decision um, and uh, good luck with whatever you decide to do. Uh, Michael Reyes, hi Michael. What is the key to finding and keeping employees? We wash cars. It's not hard work or long work. It's quite fun and freeing, but it's hard to find people who are willing to commit to a full-time position, even with great pay. At the car wash. Yeah, I remember that from the 80s, 80s pop. Anyway, um, so uh, let's talk a minute about recruiting. How are you recruiting? Are you recruiting friends? Probably not a good idea. Have you got a sign up in your car wash saying we need people? Better idea. Are you running ads or put posting on Facebook? Better idea. But anyway, the question is, how do you recruit the people? And then the next question is onboarding. How do you onboard them? Okay, they say, I'll do it. And then after they do it for a few weeks, they go, I don't like this and my friends make fun of me because I wash cars. And so you have to prepare them for all that beforehand. And you have to prepare them for the fact that uh, it, this is not a glamorous job, but it pays well and has flexible hours. And you know you make people feel good when you do the job, okay? Does everybody make sense to everybody? Retention is a function of loyalty. So if the person uh, believes that you are helping him become a better person, either financially or intellectually, spiritually. If that person believes that you are contributing to the forward advancement of their life or their survival, then they'll stick around. But it, it, they won't if they don't feel that way. And we know, it doesn't matter what the job is, we know that 60% of every employee out there today is willing to look at another opportunity. That means only 40% of the people, that includes the CFOs, the CEOs, everybody, you know, 60% are willing to walk for a better opportunity. So retention then becomes a function of how well you 
uh, deal with the people you work with and how much they feel like they're getting from the job in addition to the pay. But we can talk about it sometime if you if uh, you want to contact me through Sean. All right, those are all my questions for today. Those are some good questions, guys. And uh, keep the cards and letters coming. And I will, for those of you I don't talk to every week, I will see you next month. Bye.